Welcome back. Now, with jobs all too hard to find, it is becoming increasingly important to ensure that you are able to continue supporting yourself and your family should you lose your income. We take a look at why income protection is so important in today's financial climate. At the desk, we have Craig Turton, financial planner and managing director of Chartered Risk Solutions, and of course, my co-host. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Of course, Craig, let me perhaps start off with what exactly are you buying uh, when you're buying income protection insurance? Um, income protection is basically an insurance product, an insurance benefit, which you would take out to protect your salary in the event of a illness or a disability. So the, the income protection will kick in if you're unfortunate enough to have a, a disability or an illness that will no longer be able to sustain uh, your job. Um, the benefit will then kick in um, after a certain period of time according to the type of policy which you've taken out. Can you get income protection that protects against loss of income because you lose your job? No. There's, the, the, there's different forms of income protection. Yeah. So, the, so, so the, the, the particular one I'm referring to mm. would sort of replace it in the event of a death or, or sorry, disability or, a, or an illness. I think what you're referring to could be a retrenchment benefit, okay. which is um, a totally different benefit, which I think you know, as it's happening more and more out there, insurance companies are, are coming to realize that they need to offer it. So um, that is in the marketplace at the moment. But very good point, uh, two totally different um, okay. products. I had, I had the distinct displeasure of going through the dread disease and disability cover process recently. And what, what really bothered me about it is that it's not simple. Nothing about it is simple. Mm. Are you, so if, for example, your dread disease cover mm. is scaled. So if you get a mild heart attack, it only pays out 25% of what you want on certain mm. things, but mm. each mm. offering is different. So sure. what are the main key things that you should be looking at to make sure that you don't buy a dud product? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a very, very good point. And I, I think an income protection policy is, is complex in itself. And I think it, it always should be done in conjunction with a financial planner. Um, because there are so many factors which you do need to take into account. So a person's balance sheet, a person's a assets, a person's debts, um, the fact if, if they do have an emergency fund, um, all of that sort of depends on what type of product, what type of insurance you do need to take out. So, um, you know, th those are decisions which need to be made together with somebody uh, to assist you in making the right decision. So when your benefits have been paid out, uh, is the premium wavered uh, during that period? Yes. Okay. So one of the things that I've always, you know, we, we've chatted to a couple of people about this, and one of the things that's very interesting is you've almost got to justify that you've really lost your ability to earn an income. So, you know, if you lo lost your job and you were a um, teacher but you could still do some something to be able to supplement your income, you almost start butting heads with the, with the insurer saying, mm -hmm. but the, the insurer's arguing, yes, you could be earning it. Mm -hmm. How important, how, what, what's the distinction between when you are employed doing a specific, let's say I'm employed as a journalist, mm -hmm. I can no longer, I, I lose my use of my right hand. Mm -hmm. The argument is then, but I'd still have my left hand to be able to create content. Yeah, how do, how sure, do you handle sure. or, or educate somebody around mm -hmm. getting the right kind of cover that they're not going to get this pushback at the moment that they, they do suffer mm -hmm. a life changing yeah. event? As, as a financial planner, it is, it is quite difficult and, and you know, throw into the mix all the, the different types of products out there, you know, and, and as you were saying earlier, it's, they, they all cover different things. So uh, it's, it's, I think it's all about making sure that the client understands what they've taken out, um, understands what sort of, is it own or is it own and similar? Mm -hmm. So that's where the differentiator comes in. So make sure that you've got own, um, you know, disability income protection. There's nothing where, you know, if you can do something similar, um, then we, you know, if you're if you're a doctor, then you know, as you were saying, you lose the, right, the use of a hand, you can still go and lecture. Mm. Um, so make sure that you know your specific occupation is very specific, is protected, and and have that discussion with your financial planner to make sure that um, you want to be protected for the job you're doing now, and nothing more uh, more similar to it. Perhaps if we, if we were to look at who exactly should be, who could benefit the most from income protection, I would automatically think that it would be jobs where somebody uses their limbs more than anything else. Mm. And if, you, if you're sitting in a job, maybe a dead job like ours, where you're using your mind and maybe your yeah. right hand occasionally, I mean, mm. is it really worth it? Is it really worth it to go and get income protection on top of the normal insurance that you're already paying? Well, I, I think, you know, in, in, in your case, I mean, you know, loss of sight would be a disability, loss of hearing could be a disability. So it's all, all those little things which are related to, to you performing the exact job that you're doing now. 
Um, so so income protection for me is a vital part of financial planning and um, it's right there at the top of the list, uh, you know, sort of under medical aids. Mm. So, um, our, you know, a lot, of, a lot of, you know, most employers out there do offer um, income protection through the group benefits. So, so there you could automatically have some form of income protection, whereas if you're a consultant and or, or, a, or a business owner, then you'd have to look at the, the income protection in, a, uh, in your personal capacity. Is there any way to calculate or any formula to calculate how much you should be paying? Because we have a friend who is much younger than us and who has terrible cover, who pays as much as I do for my income protection. So how do you know you're not overpaying? Yeah, I, I think involve your financial planner. I think I think have that discussion with them um, just to just to determine that. Um, you know, all the insurance will come in with with different risk ratings, which is going to give you a different risk premium. So um, you know, a lot of people you know out there could be paying too much. So 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 I think it's worthwhile doing that exercise because it is a expensive benefit in itself. So um, you know, do the do the exercise and, and, and use your your planner to to make sure that you are getting the best um, best deal out there. The other you know the other factor in there is that a lot of um, you know clients or insurance companies will insure you for 75% of your income so um, the discussion that I have with my clients is um, you know do we need to insure 75% of your income or should we just insure um, your monthly expenses for example so um, it is an insurance at the end of the day so as long as the client understands you know what you what you're being insured for um, and as part of a planning process then you know I think you'd sort of eliminate those uh, those concerns. I don't want to overly put you on the spot, but you, you mentioned about the, the, the companies being able to, you know, being part of the group scheme commitment. Do you get the sense that companies often underinsure their employees simply taking a, group, a bulk group commitment and it actually, you actually need to top up in your personal capacity, not just depending on what the company is offering you? Yeah, I, would, I tend to agree with you. I mean, you know, most of my clients would be employed. Mm. So, so part of that discussion is, you know, what sort of protection do you have on the disability side? And we have to have a close look. And, and sometimes those group benefit policies are quite complicated to, to yeah. read and to, and, and to justify. But um, I, I think you, you would have to dig a little bit deeper and, and, and see um, on, in each individual space exactly what you insured for there. Craig, what happens if you uh, heal um, and uh, it, you might not get back to you know the, the form that you were in but you have a medical breakthrough you know is there monitoring and evaluation that happens to ensure that uh, you you stop getting those payouts at the, at the right time? Yes, the companies generally do do an annual uh, medical assessment to, to, to determine whether you are medically fit to, to continue working. So um, there, there's two different levels. There's a temporary um, income protection, which, you know, if you've got something quite mild, which, you know, you'll probably recover from, it will pay you um, until you've recovered from it. Um, linked to it then is the, is the permanent disability. So if you deem to be medically permanently disabled, then it's going to pay you up until an age which is specified in the policy document. So it could be 55, uh, 60, 65, whatever you know your financial planner has uh, has put on there so they can choose so one of the things that I find quite interesting is this debate yeah obviously media we, we, we make use of quite a lot of freelance type skills so the, there's the permanently employed and then there are those who operate as freelancers how do you go about I, I can work out it's pretty straight I think you can work out what you're doing if, if you're permanently employed you know what you're expecting in terms of income you know what you will need to replace should you should, should something happen how does a freelancer approach that though? You, know, you get a lot of consultants and informal workers within, your, within the workforce at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. How do they approach it from that perspective? Yeah, I think as you say, they, um, their, their income is going to fluctuate over the year. So the, the, the correct way for, for us to, well I think, to, to approach that is, is, is to take an average over the last year to determine what your income has been. Um, and, and insurance companies will, will, will generally look at that um, and offer you 75% of that. Can you go above that though? Can, I mean, can you insure yourself for more than you're actually earning? In terms of income protection, you can't. I know yeah. there, there's a product out there which has pushed it up to to 100%, mm. um, but uh, but still a few questions regarding that in terms of you know, does it cover you for your actual occupation, or does it refer more back to a functional type impairment mm. where it will insure you for the loss of a, a hand or or an arm, mm. those sort of things. At which point does personal protection become redundant? I mean, when in your personal profile? So obviously through the years you you'd save and you'd have 
a retirement annuity. I mean, should you should you insure yourself until you're 70, or should, can you stop when you're 40? Yeah, it's a good question, yeah, and, and I think it, it goes back to um, to sort of assets and and liquid funds which you, which you have available to you. So, um, you know, at our at our company, we have the philosophy that if you can afford to retire. Uh, then you could probably afford to die, so you don't need to have any form of life cover. So you could equate that back to um, if, if you've got enough of an asset base, then you know there's no point in really contributing to um, an insurance product um, to, uh, to to pay you out in the day when your asset base can cover you. We'll wrap it there on that very depressing note. I feel like all we've been talking about is just depression. And it doesn't get any better because we're now going to turn to our Befriend the Trend. In this week's Befriend the Trend, we look at financial planning in preparation for the worst. Now, the article, as I said, just takes the depression scales even further, looks at uh, dementia and Alzheimer's uh, diseases. I mean, let me come to you first, Mark. You know, are financial planners thinking about these things? Do they have early warning mechanisms uh, to detect whether their clients are suffering from these diseases? And how do they respond? So like when the stats that kind of blew my mind was that 66% of those uh, of people that suffer from dementia or, or, or mental related illnesses are actually living in low and middle income. Sure. Uh, so effectively you're merging market economies. So, you know, this is something we, we can pretend doesn't happen. But it's actually out there and it is impacting a lot of our, um, and it impacts countries like South Africa and the number is growing. Look, I think we live in high stress environments anyway, um, but I do think that it's something that we just, we don't, we don't think about. And I mean, one of, the, one of the comments in the article itself was a guy has been very successful. He doesn't want to end up then losing his money. He, he's built up a big nest egg. He doesn't want to lose his money if he loses it, so <laughs> to speak. Um, and he and, and, the, and the question was, that how do you actually go, around, go about planning for it? And, and the, the trend is that there are a lot of mental related illnesses now starting to impact people in across the globe. And in fact, Discovery touched on it in, in, their, in their annual report this year, just to saying that the, 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 the biggest challenge in terms of personal wealth is going to be, uh, it will be your lifestyle choices. It's going to impact you from a medical perspective, it's going to, uh, and from a mental perspective. So you need to be out there thinking about these things. And obviously, it, it's probably something that tends to catch you toward the, the end of your career, but it's something you have to actually face up to and be able to. To, to plan for. We've got less than a minute, so I'm just going to jump quickly to you, Craig. I mean, are you finding that uh, fund managers and financial advisors are actually thinking about this? Are they, re are they shaping their business models in such a way that they can offer this kind of service where they can detect these diseases and then respond accordingly? Yeah, I, think, uh, I think I would tend to agree that, uh, that discovery and the, the, the medical um, aid sort of sector is, is sort of covering that to try and make provision for those sort of events. Um, on, the, on the insurance side it is a big factor and, and it, it should be made more aware of um, in my opinion for sure. Well, I'm not sure whether the Finwick team is losing it today or not, <laughs> but it certainly seems that they've geared us for a very, very depressing uh, conversation.